It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm not a scientist, but this podcast introduces you to scientists who are working with threatened and endangered birds, and we examine all the kinds of activities that people are undertaking to try and save them. And today, I'm speaking with Simon Verdon. Do we call you a PhD candidate, Simon? I guess I'm in this uh, no man's land in the middle, actually. Submitted, but not uh, accepted yet. So. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to tick off and say you've done the work. You've right. done your PhD work. You're just waiting on the... Uh... Call me Professor, maybe. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, no. yeah. Professor Simon from <laughs> La Trobe. La Trobe University is where you sort of hatched this this study, and it was on the Mallee emu wren. Now, a lot of people love emu wrens. Very few of those people who love emu wrens have seen emu wrens. Simon, thanks for joining us on the bird emergency. How are you? Very good, thanks. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, for listeners, I... I got some background material from Simon, and I have to say, I have never enjoyed reading a sort of treatise of a fieldwork project as much as I have when I read Rising from the Ashes, which Simon tells me was published in Wildlife Australia. Simon has the gift of a writer as well as the the diligent application of a scientist. So thanks very much, Simon. That was a pleasure. I did not feel like I was wading through a dirgy document. So good on you. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I enjoyed writing it very much. I guess you're often thinking about papers and trying to write scientific papers, and it was a opportunity to yeah spread my wings, if you will. Now, <laughs> good segue, I can't resist. Yeah. Imagine seeing the world through, your, through the eyes of a wedge-tailed eagle. You're soaring more than 6,000 metres above the earth, easily crossing vast wilderness areas in a single morning from Mallee woodlands to wheat fields. I'm going to leave it there, Simon. But that's the that's the opening paragraph. I didn't have my glasses on, so so I struggled a bit with it. I got shivers. What's going oh, to happen now? Yeah. Now we've now we've hoofed around a bit. The Mallee emu wren and translocations. Just before we talk about all of the kind of issues with translocations in conservation management, tell us why the Mallee emu wren has had to be translocated. Where from, where to, and why did it need to happen? Yeah, okay, I can do that. Yeah, this has been working on the Mallee emu wren for now six years, including all my PhD work and some work since then. And all of it's been focused around looking at the history of the region and you know, how we got to this point and then trying to use that sort of thinking of how we could get out of this point where it's an endangered species. And, yeah, so that, that's where I had it from. So if you think of it chronologically, which I like to do sometimes, I think of a century ago when all of the post-war soldier settlers came into the Mallee and were given blocks of land in the Mallee and encouraged to clear. And there was a railway line put in which led to more industrialised clearing levels. And that led to this from a huge intact Mallee woodlands all across northwestern Victoria and across the border to South Australia that turned into mostly wheat fields with you know some large parks left behind and usually those parks are actually on you know probably the less fertile soils and so that that's the modern situation we have for emurens and then they're in these pocketed pocketed areas of remnant vegetation and that means that when big fires come through instead of wiping out just a small part of a really large landscape there, they could wipe out a whole reserve in a single wildfire event. And that's exactly what we've seen happen, especially over the last 10 or 20 years. We've seen multiple reserve scale wildfires. And then all of a sudden, if you're talking about that reserve as a unit, then the bird's extinct from that reserve. And it's not a bird that can fly across wheat fields or fly any great distance at all. And so 
without translocations, then that's just going to keep on occurring until you've got one reserve left and then keep occurring until you've got no reserves left. And we were seeing that happen, seeing that process take place. It was going down from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7. And then in 2014, there were two really big wildfires in South Australia and that made it extinct from two more reserves. So we were getting right down to the pointy end at that point. I think I'll I'll just try and paint the picture of the landscape and the situation a little bit, Simon, so that international listeners can get an idea of what it's like. The Mallee is almost desert. If that's how we sort of see it in in Australia, but it's not the kind of desert that you classically think of with sand dunes and all that kind of stuff. It's it it's it has very few height variations. So it's if you're looking at it on a broad um, scale, it's essentially flat, but it it has variations of maybe 10, 15 metres. And because it's such a low rainfall area, the lower areas where rain accumulates after downpours, because we don't get regular rain in this part of Australia, those areas become the fertile areas. All the nutrients leach down and they're the best areas. Now, after the First World War, the government in Australia divvied up all this land. It's a bit like the great land rush in America to return soldiers. And these blocks were quite small, so a family would work them. But all of the good land was allocated and was cleared. And as Simon said, these little areas of disjointed land has been left as remnant bush, scrubby woodland, and it's it's dotted with spinifex grass, which is the preferred habitat of the emu wren. But these areas, because they were a little bit higher up, you know, sitting on little hummocks or hillocks, have been spread apart. And as you mentioned in your in your article, Simon, the, the emu wren finds a flight of 10 metres to be the equivalent of a marathon. <laughs> so, And the birds are tiny. How much do they weigh? Yeah, four to six grams. So equal smallest in Australia with the wee bill in terms of weight. Yeah, and if... And if you're aware of the fairy wrens, which, you know, famous Australian birds, the superb fairy wren or the splendid fairy wren, um, they're very, very similar. But those birds, the fairy wrens can actually move about, get about a lot better than the emu wrens. So, so I've waffled on, but that's why the Mallee is so at risk. The emu wren can't get the... 400, 500, 600 metres if there happens to be a fire to get to the next bit of safe ground. And they certainly can't get, what, 50 kilometres, 80 kilometres that the translocation areas were separated by. And and again, for international listeners, the area we're talking about is at the joint, the, the area, the... the the place where Victoria, the state of Victoria, and South Australia and New South Wales all come together. And in in the past, the national park that is in Victoria and the reserve that adjoins it in South Australia, actually before the the clearing happened after the First World War, it went for several hundred miles. And not only is the emu wren threatened here, there's a group of dry woodland mallee species which are all threatened because of this disjointed habitat and two fires in succession wiping out a whole area has really meant these fellas in grave danger. Simon, before the fires, what was the population estimate for for the emu wrens in this contiguous 
National Park area? It's a tricky one to answer because they're, they're, they're very hard to find <laughs> and um, they're in these wilderness areas, so it's hard to get our heads around it too well. But I think the best guess was 16,000 roughly, and that was also – they're also declining – where they're found in the absence of fire. So, that, yeah, that had become out of date because that was from more than 10 years ago. Yeah, so it was it was sort of 16,000, but it was well accepted that that was probably an overestimate of what they were at the time. Yeah. But it was more about the fires. They weren't about how many birds they wiped out. It was how many populations they wiped out. That's, was, that. There were four populations in existence and those fires wiped out two of them. And so we were down to two. Yeah. I'd also add about the fire is... The fires we're talking about that are wiping down populations, they're, they're, they're not your average fire. They're, they're big, very big, very hot, very fast moving. So they're dry lightning that happens in summer and they can burn the best part of a you know, 60,000 hectare reserve, which we count as a smaller reserve in this part of the world. 60,000 hectares, they can burn that in a couple of days. And that's what happened with Biliat, which is one of the reserves in South Australia, a couple of days is all it took for that whole reserve to burn. And so it's an interesting little nexus that Malinurin sits in because those fires, the big, the really big ones, they're causing the extinction of the species we're seeing happen, whereas the habitat that it needs to thrive requires fire to regenerate. So that's, that's what I found really interesting about the situation this bird is in is excluding fire is not, is not enough. You've got to do the right fire and that balancing act and that uh, contradiction is what I guess really attracted me to this this problem, yeah. Simon, are we able to say that these hot fires that are not what the bird needs, increasing in frequency because of climate change, are we able to make a link? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean... It's quite the link is quite easy to make because the risk of really large so most of the fires that you get in the Mallee are going to be hot but the really large ones they're the ones we're worried about and so it's about you can just look how many extreme fire weather days so an extreme fire weather days has a temperature above whatever and a, and high winds and you know there's a balance of those two factors as well as fuel dryness and that sort of thing. So how many extreme fire, fire weather days were there, you know, with in the absence of climate change and with climate change and the number of days increases in these times versus, you know, say 1950s. So in that regard, then I think the, the link for conditions that would create these really large fires that are impossible to control, yeah, that's become worse because of climate change. So the management technique to preserve the bird was going to be translocations. Were there any other options? Yeah, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a one it's not a silver bullet, I think that's the phrase, isn't it? So translocations was pretty much an emergency intervention because you know this happened in 2014 in the summer and there was some crisis meetings with some you know agency and people that were concerned and the, there was a very real risk of that the very next summer could mean, you know, another two get wiped out and then they're the last two and then it's all over. So it was like, what are we going to do right now to yeah, to fix this problem or to at least lower the risk to a manageable level? So, yeah, translocations, we could just get one more population in there, then that would reduce the risk of an extinction in one bad summer. And that was the goal of the translocations. But there's a lot of other work that has to happen as well to conserve the longer term because, I mean, apart from anything else, translocations are just really hard work so to be repeatedly letting the bird get burnt out locally from a whole reserve and going extinct in a reserve and then just replacing it manually i mean that's no way to go it's it's too much work and no promise of success and all of those sorts of things too much money so yeah the other side of the coin to translocations was also trying to manage them better in terms of fire and risk in the locations they already are so two-pronged approach i guess how many actual uh, I don't mean how many actual birds have you moved but how many times have you now taken a couple of birds from one population and moved them to another suitable habitat where there is a population or where there isn't 
a population. Have you? Is, is it four times, five times, dozen it's, times? It's two times. So we moved them two times from their largest population to a reserve called Narcat, and Narcat was one of the fires in 2014 that burnt, you know, the population went locally extinct there. So we moved them from different areas in their, their remaining populations. We moved them to Narcat to try and reestablish that population there. And, yeah, so we moved them once in autumn and once in spring. So I guess the first time in autumn there were no birds there, and so they were completely on their own when we released them. And then the second time the idea was at least that when we moved them they'd be sort of supplementing the birds that had come a few months earlier. Now, trapping and moving birds is stressful, so there's a lot of risk involved in in this just because of what you're just the basic act of what you're doing. Are the are the birds all captured at the source location at the same time? And are they are they then housed together so they can get to know each other? Or do they already know each other, do you think, before you release them? Like what's the Tell us exactly how that process goes down. Oh, it was it was a logistical nightmare. Like genuinely, the complexities that even the small complexities that just added on one another to make it feel nearly impossible most of the time. Um, so yeah, it's a really good question because it is interesting to think about how you how should you move birds and how shouldn't you and what social structure do they require and do they have. So we did think about that very carefully, and I I will talk about that. But the truth is, like, this was an emergency intervention, as I mentioned, and we don't know most of that stuff. We have guesses about their social structure and organisation, but we didn't have time because it's really hard to figure that stuff out. It takes 10 years of study to get an answer to some of that stuff. And that was the whole point was we had to do this now. So we did some guesswork, but then we also developed the whole program in a sort of an experimental framework. So we did different types of moves and saw which ones worked the best. So we were really interested in the social housing and social grouping. So mainly we tried to catch, we thought that would be best for the birds. So we tried to catch familiar groups. There might be a pair hopping around, so two birds, and there might be a family, especially in autumn, often there's bigger families. So it might be two birds and what we presume are last year's offspring, maybe two or three of them. So you could catch a group of five. So we try to catch them together, house them together, and then release them together. Uh, and then there's also times when you can't catch a pair or you, you catch one bird in one spot and one bird in another spot, and then you release them and they're complete strangers to one another. And, you know, that would be great if that was fine. And, yeah, and so we tried it. But also we, yeah, we had a feeling that it would be better to release families together. But the tricky thing that came in was it's hard to know who's it. Like you catch a male and a female bird together. They're very incredibly hard to see and find. So they live in this yeah, spiny grass, spinifex grass, and they don't, you know, they hardly make a sound. They're very small. They're sand colored and they don't necessarily fly off. When you come close, they stay within this grass. But it's, the grass is like, how do I describe it? It's, it's a huge dome and you can't, you, it's impenetrable. You can't sit in it. So if it stays in the middle, you could be standing on top of that hummock and, and not even know the bird's in there. And so we think we have two birds in a location. We try and catch them and there could have been four there and we don't know about it. And so, <laughs> so the funny thing is if we catch two birds and we think that they're, you know, we assume they're a pair and release them as a pair to keep the social grouping together, but they could have been a father-daughter and then maybe maybe they don't want to breed together for because of um, inbreeding and that sort of thing. Or maybe they were from neighbouring territories and they came together in if we were using their calls to try and catch them, they came together because of the commotion. And then we catch them and we make a wrong judgment about if they're familiar or not. So all of that unknowns and complexities made it really hard. Yeah, so we tried and we tried to make it experimental. In the end, it didn't seem like familiar, unfamiliar was... We were mostly able to catch the familiar groups and it didn't seem like familiar versus unfamiliar was, a, was a, the, the hugest deal in the world for their success post-release. So, yeah, it would be great to know the answers, but honestly, a lot of this work raised more questions than, than answers. Hmm. 
Well, that's that's often the case, which is why commitment for ongoing funding is really, really important for any of these projects. But Simon, you mentioned that after capture that the birds were sort of housed together before release. How long were they held together? And the thing I'm curious about is because they they are not highly mobile, that they don't fly very far, would would something like a great flight aviary in you know in modeling a Mali setting would would they lend themselves to captive breeding do you think well we'll soon find out i think so manado zoo we're working they're part of the same group we're part of the same group we're working together and they're hoping to start some captive breeding of Mali murens very soon but that's again that's a whole process a whole undertaking right. with no promise of success and then there's also the question of if you have what you know if you release the birds, what do you what do you will they be successful because they've been reared in captivity? So um, yeah, that, that's a whole extra can of worms. But we didn't use a great aviary when we were transporting birds. We used a you know high tech shoebox, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. So they. So they were they were housed in close proximity for a short period of time. Yeah, originally we wanted to try and catch them and release them the same day, but it was pretty much impossible to do that logistically. So we kept them overnight. So we really we wanted to release them in the morning so they could, you know, so they're not released in this strange environment and then they have to find somewhere to be safe straight away in dusk. So we held on to them and we released them, yeah, the following morning and then they had the whole day to acclimatise. And one of the logistical problems that you had, as I understand, is that there are no roads in this area. There's not really formed tracks. So that's a benefit for taking them so far from where they might get disturbed. But it means it's really difficult for a a couple of you, the group of you who are carrying these little boxes to to get to a suitable location because obviously you need to you need to know there's water as well as shelter within what a couple of probably a hundred meters is probably the maximum that they can get around in an you know in an afternoon if they're if they're thirsty. Well they don't need water. Yeah, they wouldn't be living out there if they needed water. So I think they just get all their moisture requirements from their food, insects, insects and spiders, which is true of most of the birds out there, I think, except for like the parrots, like the bronze wings probably are drinking each day. So there's that. Yeah. So they have that on their side. Yeah. Brilliant. Sorry, Simon. With, so they're getting their water requirements from invertebrates that they're, that they're eating. <laughs> did, you, did you know that there was... A food source there like did you actually know it or did you just assume that because of the nature of the habitat yeah so for the release site you mean yeah 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 so we were assuming we didn't we didn't measure the insects because even if yeah, we, yeah. so they yeah. The, the the thing for the ignorance is we were returning them to where they used to be before the fire so one of the key things with a successful translocation is make sure that you understand the reason for the decline in the first place yeah. and that you've made steps to reduce the, you know, the impact of that reason. So ours was quite clear cut. We knew it was because of fire and then we did some strategic breaks to lower the fire risk around the release site and then we released them. And we knew the habitat looked pretty good for them and we knew they were there before. And and so, yeah, it was a, it was a big assumption that the insects were there. And then yeah. it's there. So then, for instance, then if you have a bad drought, the following year and all the insect numbers go way down then maybe they don't have enough food anymore mm-hmm. yeah. yeah that that was the, th- the thought that crossed my mind was maybe the you know in, in, insects are very resilient when fires happen but maybe the fire was a catastrophe for for the in, for the insects as well so let's yeah. so uh, the, yeah. the the particular location we released them it wasn't just burnt recently. It didn't burn in that big fire I mentioned. It burnt sort of around ten years earlier. So yeah, it was around it was around fifteen years since the like, the release site had burnt. 
So it was all looking very vigorous and green and big spin effects everywhere, big bank sears everywhere. Yeah. The, the thing about measuring the insects, which, you know, we talked about a lot and would be really interesting to do. Say we did try and measure some insects and we put out some traps for insects and some pitfall traps. And then, you know, we looked at the data and we had insects in them. We wouldn't know what to say with that information regarding like how many insects in my vial yeah, does it mean yeah. sufficient insects for a malignant? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so it's, it's a big, and, yeah, the whole measuring food resources is another, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of challenges, yeah. Well, that that's why all of these problems, all these things that need to be solved, and I, I don't like using those words because it's just information gathering, but they have to be longitudinal studies. You can't, you know, it's... It, Three-year funding doesn't generally it raises more questions than than it answers, and we're we're not going to be making better and better decisions for conservation management without continual work on the same species or on the same locations or on the same habitats. We need we need to be quite broad in the way we think about it. Yeah, so, I, I definitely, so on, definitely agree. And then, but the other thing I think about is, you know, say we have been measuring, often the question that you want to be asking is so particular that the way you collect the information has to be perfectly shaped for that particular question. And so often if you go and you look at historic data sets to try and answer your question, they're just there's just something that's not quite right with them and you can garner some information but you you go away and you yeah, do a specially designed study to answer that one question and that doesn't apply to the next question that comes along. So a mix would be good. A mix would be ideal, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with the difficulty in getting getting to the site regularly because it's so remote, what what do you think the success has been what and let, let let's sort of see if there's some good news and then I want to go back to some more of the methodology of mm-hmm. of how you've done things. Yeah. So the success of the translocation. Mm. So I guess it wasn't. It definitely wasn't a complete success. So I'll just qualify it there. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, um, that, that not everything works. So let, let how how many birds did did you did you move and to how many new locations or previous, previously populated locations and how many yeah. do you think so, are, are surviving now and are they, are they breeding? Do we know that? Yeah. So, so yeah, this is nothing like this had ever been done before. So we had a few sort of tiered questions and one is, you know, can we catch these birds at all? <laughs> Which was not known. I mean, we know that one person had caught some before, but the level of effort they put in per bird was out of this world. And if we move them, are they all just going to die because of the stress of the move, which mm. is a huge undertaking as well? And will they adapt to this new environment? And so they were all like the first set of questions. And we could say yes to all of those. We did catch the birds. We moved them successfully and they were they were quite resilient. And then we released them and they seemed quite happy in the new environment. That was all great. And then not long after the release, then there was some really successful breeding events. So the maximum clutch for this species is three. And there were multiple sightings of three off, three fledglings, pairs building nests and then yeah, laying and successfully feeding their young until those young fledged. And that's like getting getting successful breeding in the first season is a huge measure for translocation programs because generally your your older individual adults that you've caught are going to be a bit less resilient to this new environment and you know they might be a bit old anyway and they've gone under the stress of capture and so what you're really investing in is the first generation that's new in that environment so that was huge that was a, a huge success story for us until a few months later and this was in summertime they yeah the population really dropped off until i think we found one so it was, a, it was a long, hot, dry summer, which is you know, a lot of summers there, but this was below the average for rainfall, even compared to other years. And so we released birds in spring and they were breeding really well. And then they saw them decline over summer until, you know, a few months later, after the peak of summer, we found we could find one, one bird, which was a huge letdown because yeah, it went from 
the highs of such successful breeding to to look like they didn't probably survive the summer very well because of the struggling with the heat. So that was, yeah, I think that was a disappointing outcome, especially after we we passed a lot of those hurdles that, that I mentioned. And so it was as close to success as you could hope for, but they still didn't establish a population. But there, yeah, so partial success is how we've defined it because we've answered a lot of the questions we wanted to answer, but we didn't make a new population. But yeah, so, I mean, there's always a lot of doubts as with your first try that you're going to establish a new population from moving a, a handful of birds. So we're not given up that it's, we still think it's possible and worth pursuing, but haven't quite achieved it yet. So how, let, let's start with how you caught them. How did that, how did you, like you use bird calls you use their mating calls, I, I, I assume. How, how successful was that? Did it, did, was it hit and miss? You, are you, how are you miss netting? I'm assuming you miss netting. No. How are you? No, how are you capturing them? So yeah, there's two challenges, I guess. More maybe there's three challenges. The first is just finding the birds, so that because they're incredibly hard to find, like they're famously hard to find. They're a big one for bird watchers because um, they're only in one location in the world. So that endemism gives extra points for a, a bird. They're, they're iconic for that region because they're only in the Mali. They're called the Mali Inurin. The region's the Mali. The tree's the Mali. And um, they're tiny and, yeah, really hard to detect anyway. So finding 80 birds out there is a, is a real challenge. And like you said, it's remote and it's, and it's an endangered species. So... There's a lot of walking around, and that's when the mating calls came in. We were doing that just to find them, but you, by the time you found them, you can't fool them beyond that. So once you've honed in on some birds with the mating call, you're trying to use a group of people to sort of herd them or get them to in a situation when they feel threatened enough to hunker down inside a spinifex hummock. And then you have, and like I said before, its other name is porcupine grass, right? So... Yeah. It is just a huge dome of spines and the the needles of the grass, they have a, a dead tip. And so as soon as you touch it, the tip breaks off inside breaks your skin. It's very brittle and it will stay in there and it will get infected in yeah. all your hands and all your legs. And so that's where, you know, and that we, we were calling that a good situation for us. <laughs> we have to somehow get inside this spinifex hummock to uh, get the bird. And, yeah, so we couldn't use a mist net. And that's because they live inside these spinifex and that's effectively this interwoven network of these spines that's really dense. So, you know, pretty much emurens, they're pretty much used to moving through mist nets. That's their life, moving straight through a mist net. So I didn't try with a mist net, but others told me that you get the smallest gauge mist net and you double it over and an emuren will still just fly straight through it, which is quite unique, I think, from what I've heard. And so, yeah, we were we were using a range of other techniques like the workshopping of the techniques was really fun as well because at one point I think I suggested that we follow them around in the night time and just see where they go to sleep and then we could just go catch them while they're sleeping. <laughs> that didn't work. We couldn't follow them. We got to dusk and they just snuck off. Yeah. They'll do that as well. They'll go in one side of a hummock and then when you're distracted or there's something blocking your line of sight, they'll sneak away around the back of you to another hummock. And so by that way, then you've lost track of them. And so you might be standing thinking that they are there and they're not just in the same way that often you're standing thinking that they're not there, but actually they are and they're just staying quiet. So, yeah, eventually we figured out a method with you know, throwing a net over a hummock and try and flush them out from one side into the other side and you try and catch them when they come out. But, yeah, it was it, it was mayhem. It was pretty much <laughs> absolute mayhem. <laughs> But by the end, yeah, we managed to get 80. I think on the first day was the biggest shock. So we had, to, we had no idea how long this would take. And you had to plan all the logistics for moving and transporting and releasing and had a huge number of people there, lots of volunteers. And then on the first day, we caught, I think, 18 birds, and which was out of this world high number. We were thinking five birds a day or something. And then we're like, what the hell do we do with 18 birds? We've got no one at the release site yet. There's just one guy there checking it out. We were planning to spend five days at the source site. And so then that was a very long conversation about logistics and how to get these birds across. I think maybe we released a couple again because we just couldn't handle that number. But yeah, it was so it was sort of like the best laid plans of mice and men. 
Yeah. So you you that eighteen that you caught on the first eight, how how long until you did release those birds and how far away what is the release site? So we, yeah, so we catch the birds and do some measurements and then we drive them across to South Australia. It's around 200 kilometres. So most of that was fine from the catch site. Well, depending on which catch site, but one of our catch sites and on this particular day, we went straight onto the bitumen. So it's nice and it's flat and good for the birds. And then we would go to South Australia near the release site and we'd stay overnight there with the birds. And so then the following morning we'd release them. So 200 kilometres, one one night, but that following morning has quite a lot of off-road driving and that was the bumpy section, which was not so good for the birds. Yeah. So from, so from the 80, you only detected one, but how many sites did you release them into and how many times have people been back to try and find them? So it depends on what you count as the site, I guess. So I think... It's pretty much one site we released them. Like it wasn't the same spot, but it was all in like yeah. a ten kilometer by ten kilometer area. And so we'd release them in little pockets of habitat that you know a pair could feasibly use as their own and they could have little territories, which they immediately, you know, undermined. <laughs> all of the all of the birds sort of zipped between each other's pocket release sites. So then you know, we had a pair that we released at site three and by the end of the next day we found it at site seven and vice versa and the pairs that we released would switch with each other and find their own pairings. They just, yeah, they tore down all our perfect plans. It was quite funny. And they were moving a lot further than we had expected, which was one of the great things to learn from the project. Like we found one male that had gone from the top of the release site down to the bottom and then back up to the top over a, a period of weeks. And uh, so... Yeah, so we've done plenty of surveying. I mean, there was there were some problems with detectability because we couldn't put the like we said, the birds are tiny, right? Like five grams or whatever. So you can't put a tracker on them. I know we put we put tiny trackers on bumblebees and, and dragonflies now, which is really cool. One thing is they they only go for a couple of hours, I think, those trackers, which is useless for us. And now you can probably get trackers that could work for a bit longer but because again they're going through this spinifex grass and it anything we stick on their back it sort of bumps into the spines and yeah can they can get stuck or it can get ripped off uh, so and even if it's a tiny tracker it's still adding extra weight so with all that considered we couldn't track them and so we we're just looking for them and it's a huge area and so some mornings when you release them you're supposed to follow them to see their immediate movements and try and keep track of them and look over days. And they just take off in one direction through the undergrowth, like just moving slowly but consistently. So you follow them for maybe four hours and they've ended up down the other end of the release area and you've kept track of them. Or what happened to me on the first day, I had to follow the first released birds and like within five minutes, I had no idea where they'd, where they'd gone. Like, yeah. Over that, I was like, oh, yeah, they went that way. I'll go after them. I went after them. They were gone, and we never saw that pair again. So we can be – we. I think we can be optimistic that, that more than one of those birds is is out there or was still out there. How long do they live if they are getting uh, good seasons? Do we, Are they five-year bird? Are they three-year bird? Yeah, we reckon about five. We don't know for this species, but for the, I think it's the southern Inuren, there was one banded bird um, that was six or seven years old, I think. Yeah, so I think something like that, but generally probably five, and the females probably die um, at a higher rate than the males. Because of the stress of stress of bringing up the, the, the family. <laughs> I'd That's... say so. I'd say, I also think it might be, well, at least this, a lot of this is judging from the southern Inuren because that's been studied a bit more than the Mali Inuren, but I think it's a dangerous thing to be yeah, incubating the nest, especially with snakes around. Yeah, snakes. So that's are, yeah. quite unfounded, yeah. but that's probably a big predator for sitting on a nest. Cats a problem in this area? Have they Have they infiltrated that far? Oh, there's cats there, definitely. There's also dingoes, which keep the cats down, I guess. Hmm. But then the dingoes are baited, which is, you know, 
a travesty in my opinion, but because it's a reserve as well. So that would have another effect. But I don't think cats are an issue for Mallee murens because they, the, as long as the, the spin effects is there, then there's no cat getting in that spin effects the way an emuren does. So hmm. I think, yeah, nighttime, if there's predators that get them when they're roosting at night, a nocturnal predator like a snake, or if there's something getting them when they're on the nest, the nest is also built into the spin effects as well. So it's still safe from cats even then, I'd say. Yeah. Hmm. So the the project was a collaboration of I think in your article you mentioned 13 partners so that's funding and then providing logistic support and all that everything you need um has it has it generally been assessed as a success yeah yeah we set up measures of success in the beginning but we framed because we would yeah you're never confident necessarily that you can just so easily establish a population in one go. So we framed the measures of success around what I mentioned earlier. So, you know, can we feasibly move them? Can we monitor them effectively? Can they breed in their first season? Do they survive the release? And so for all those measures, then, yeah, we count it as, as a success. So on paper, according to our own metrics, then it is a success. But, you know, the ultimate test is clearly did we make a new population? Because that's, that, that would be the dream story here. Like, we did it, you know, and it is, we established a new population and that that hasn't happened. So, so well, you, yeah, I'd say. Well, you haven't been able to to prove that it hasn't happened. But I, the, my, my question about how often and and for how long have you been out to assess if, if those birds are still there, because that, that, that's a that's a big area for such a difficult to find bird. Yeah, sure. But say, so it's, it's really interesting you're saying these points. Like, and obviously we've they're the really interesting points to discuss, and we've talked about them a lot. But and I think that our perspectives are different as well because you know I didn't spend all the time surveying, but I spent a lot of time surveying. But some people, it's more than me even. And it is just like, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of just walking around all day, not finding them. And it is depressing. It's so sad to be, you know, you've gone through this whole project and you spend all your energies on this thing and you're walking around and they're never there. And you're always playing the bird call, like hoping <laughs> hoping they'll respond and, yeah, you just get quite dejected through the day. So that probably fit into our perspective a bit compared to yours. You're like, oh, no, they could still be there. But also... <laughs> Oh, sorry, I also wonder whether if you're still trying to attract them with calls, they it, it just might it just might be a time or a day where they're just not interested in rep, in responding. So, because that's a method lots of people have used to try and see them, and for every hundred people who go out to locate Mallee emu wrens and tick off, I don't think that. I don't think that more than 50 would be successful, would they? Yeah, that's right. And that's why we just keep, we we didn't just go look once. We just repeatedly looked in the same spots over and over. Mm. And, you know, we'd go pre-dawn, at least begin the surveys pre-dawn to try and optimise that and get in before the wind does and everything. So it was an intense survey effort. But the other thing is in a huge landscape like that, like you said, it's a, it's a very big reserve. If they did disperse out of the area, and that's why we didn't find them, and there's so few that you know, say say 20 birds sived out of the 80, and they dispersed across the landscape. Well, then they're not going to be able to find each other. Yeah, that's so, the that's the big challenge. That so, you know, even if they lived out a happy life on their own, yeah, feeding feasting on all the insects, no neighbours to worry them. It doesn't mean there's going to be a new population ever. So unless they all snuck off together to some promised land that we didn't know about and couldn't find and started a new population there, then I think that yeah, in terms of establishing a new population, I think it didn't quite make it. And no, the but... other thing I'd add is so there's two more things. One is that they're, they're, although it's a big reserve, they're, they're, they're very specialised in the habitat they, they, they want and prefer. So especially the spin effects, it's only in a few spots in, in the release site. So... Although the reserves big, the habitat is kind of rare. And the other thing is for translocations that, you know, 
although we'd like to imagine scenarios where it worked and we didn't realize this is the norm for translocations. Most translocations don't work at all. And even of those that do work, most of them wouldn't work on the first try. So yeah, it's, it's sort of hard to imagine a different outcome considering the evidence we have, I guess. Unless there wasn't a drought following the breeding season. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, because if you pin the failure on that, a slightly dry year. Like, so in this region, most years, and it's going to sound weird, but most years have below average rainfall. Hmm. And that's because every 10 years, you have a couple yeah. of really high rainfall years that bring the average up. So the norm is a below average rainfall year. Yeah. So yeah, it was a dry summer, and but that's what we've got to expect for the future, and that's what we've got to plan towards is getting them surviving dry summers. So it's true that yeah, the establishment phase is probably the hardest phase for them. So maybe we could look at yeah, establishing in these wet years, and that's what yeah, my publication that stimulated this conversation is about is optimizing the release conditions by moving them when it's raining and that sort of thing. So. Uh, it's definitely now, worth about it. now, the next question is probably outside the remit of, of your project, Simon, but we've we've talked about how... They're my favourite questions. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we, we've talked about how the, the habitat, the good habitat, is basically so limited because of the clearing and it's now occupied and it's agricultural land. In recent years... So much of this marginal country is no longer viable for agricultural purposes. So I'm wondering, is regeneration and linking up corridors to create new suitable habit habitat, is that an option for, for this bird? I, I reckon I reckon that's got to be the way of the future, and I, I agree. But that's the hundred-year plan, I think. Like, so we have the that, well, the short-term well, emergency well, translocations, well, and yeah. then we've got the improving our understanding and fire management in location, well, and then the long-term big picture stuff would be that would be yeah. brilliant. I'd love to do that. And there and are programs that have done it. Sorry. Uh, well, that was where my next question was going to lead because we've now got you alluded to Monato zoo in South Australia establishing a captive breeding program. I know nothing about it and I don't know what the time frame of it is yet. Mm -hmm. But but for activities like you've been undertaking and you've been studying the bird for six years, as you've said, what, what we probably need to try and do is commit to at least a 10-year program of translocations because the average of having a good season is or it comes almost to 100% within that time based on all the statistics that you collated and you're so much better at maths than me Simon from the from the from the work you did in there but do, do you think there is a enough enough birds and this really comes to the title of what of of how I name the episode. Can you can you without endangering the population with another new factor continue to harvest for want of a better term for a period of like ten years or maybe twelve years to really give the percentage chance of success a boost? Yeah, I think it's, a, it, it's that's the big question. That's the pertinent question. That's what I spent all of my 2019 doing, trying to collect data and answer that question precisely. And, I mean, I think the answer is it depends. It depends on so many things, like, <laughs> you know, well, how many birds well, are you going to move? What, what's the actually, let, 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 let's, let's just let that hang in the air for a minute because all of the international studies and I think that what was it 690 or something of them of translocations were were brought together in a in a paper that you sent me and the two biggest causes for failure or for 
problems in translocations seem to be common, whether you're talking about fish, insects, big mammal, plants, not so much, but birds. One was funding and the other was the way the animal themselves behave once they've been released. So let, let, let's, let's talk about the first one, the obvious one the one that people can influence. Is there a taste to fund this kind of uh, translocation program for so, 10 or 12 years? <laughs> do, you okay. think, do you think that's likely to, to happen? So, yeah, no. I mean, that's not, that's yeah. not how our funding cycles work, unfortunately. That, um, well, that... that but, but, that's why I asked it that way, and I'm glad you've answered it that way because that's yeah. that's our challenge, isn't it? That the commitment, it, if it's important enough to commit to it for two years or three years or one year, and you need and and success in the long run needs it to be funded for ten years, isn't it important enough to do it for ten years? That's the question that always haunts me yeah yeah absolutely i mean we've got a funding crisis in environment and conservation in general we don't have in most cases we know what needs to be done but we don't have the money to so if we had any reasonable level of funding for the environment then you know we could enact the recovery plans that are sitting on the shelves day by day mm. and then you know those recovery plans would probably work and so yeah, so we, we could do successful translocations and we could wait, we could have funding that's got flexible timing so we could wait for the big rains to make the move and we could do all of those things. But I guess there is the possibility that alternative funding sources to government funding could fill the gap here. I mean, well, conservation programs are more, getting more philanthropy funding than government maybe I and mean, they might be more open to flexible timing is one option that, for the future. I mean, you... you you you're leading you're leading exactly where my brain is going every time Simon that that you had 13 partners in in this project were they all government or quasi government organizations no they weren't so and it wasn't just funders those 13 partners because oh and yeah and the, that's right. There's there's logistics. There's practical support. There's equipment. A whole lot of whole lot of things. But I I, I just wanted to open it up to have any of those groups like the Tiverton Fund or anything like that been approached or reached out or anything like that. Yeah. No. So we haven't. We haven't. So yeah. This this has all come through a team, the Threatened Mallee Birds Conservation Action Plan team, and that's the team I'm a part of, and that's who enacted this translocation i guess as well as yeah the lead partners and everything but no we haven't like made direct links with any philanthropist or, or non-government funders really we've got yeah some funding through federal government and then a lot of you know a lot of the partners are state agencies government agencies that have their own funding through various means and that's how we've been funding any of our projects mm -hmm. there's also research grants that myself and also some people at Monash Uni have got and so that's from various different sources and that might you know both include Holsworth which is phil philanthropic funding for research but they're not funding the Holsworth Foundation doesn't fund on the million dollar scale any projects no, no. <laughs> um, yeah I think that's, that's about yeah, developing connections through yeah, personal connections with groups and developing projects together and that's not something that our group has even started on the path towards yet. Mm. Simon, I I want to I want to ask a question which I don't know if it's rude rude to do it, but I'll I'll set the question up and we'll see. Um, I'll forgive you, I guess. <laughs> well, you you and so many of the listeners and the previous guests of of this show are familiar with the scale of the grants that are given out or that are awarded. I'm, given out as the wrong term because you have to work very, very, very hard to secure one. What what people outside of the research and conservation action community don't know, and I think would be shocked to find out, 
is how much a grant to run a program like you've done is. So I, I, I don't know if you can divulge the amount of money the project has cost, but can you give us a ballpark in terms of would would one AFL football who is pretty ordinary in terms of his place in the game getting the average for a footballer, would that money fund you for three years? So, yeah, I'm, I'm ha- happy to share, absolutely. Okay. Um, oh, well, but some, because some partners and some agencies just won't talk money because... Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, I don't really yeah. know about what, what I'm obligated to not say, but I just try and ignore that stuff anyway. So, yeah, the problem is I don't remember the exact amount of that particular project. Oh, um, well, let, well, let me... Let me throw a figure at you. If if, if, yeah, if, but, if someone could if someone could give you seventy five thousand dollars, how much work would you do? So so an example is in twenty nineteen, I went I did intensive surveys for the emuren and and two other species all throughout all the source site area. I wanted to know how many birds are in how many birds are left of emurens, yeah. as well as two other species. Where are they? Where you know where are the population hotspots? I called them, and what is their response to fire? What sort of fire management do they need? And so that was that was like a nine month project, and that was funded through through bird life mostly, and that was sixty thousand yeah. dollars, and that included my my wages as a casual researcher yeah. and huge groups of volunteers and yeah. that sort of thing. So that was the one that you do on the. Like that was an insane amount of work for that budget. That's pretty much no money. So that was probably that was on one end of the spectrum, right? That's on the end of the spectrum where you're you're running on the smell of an oily rag. So and that was quite an experience. But if you were going to fund that properly, like I've put in a grant a, a application for a future project looking for habitat in another system of reserves, the release sites, looking for more habitat and where the birds are in the regions around the release sites. And that's like a two-year project, and that would be more like four hundred thousand dollars of funding. Mm. Um, but that's a that's a big pie in the sky sort of project. So that's the that's the range. I think the translocations program was around seven hundred thousand um, dollars. I could be wrong on that, but it was in, I think it was something like that. Yeah, and that was a, a multi-year program and multiple staff and all of that logistics that you yeah we've been talking about. So, so multi-year? Are we talking two years or three years? That I think the translocations were three. Um, three years. Okay. But, um, yeah, I'd have to check that as well. So uh, my point is that, and, and I don't think the wider community understands this, it, so many people are involved with the volunteers and whatnot and the the backup support that you get with the data analysis and maybe you've got a you know, you, you didn't use camera traps and whatnot, but all, all this kind of equipment that needs to be collated, a hundred grand goes a huge way. And if you're talking for three years with multiple people involved for, let's say, 700000 I mean, they're talking about paying a footballer who played seven games this year a hundred and fifty thousand a year. There's money out there. It's always just about priorities. So, I, 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 I just want to make sure that when someone listens to this in two years' time and they're sitting in the eastern suburbs of Sydney, they can place what their annual salary would buy for endangered and threatened species in the country. And, you know, some of these foundations yeah. that governing enormous amounts of money, they yeah. need to they need to look we, oh, well, we are begging them and imploring them <laughs> to look at funding these kind of studies, not with a ten thousand dollar grant to throw into a pot with 20 other government, 20 other agencies who have all begged the government and the government makes everyone happy by giving everyone $1,000. I mean, you yeah. know, come on. I mean, yeah. Environment is in a funding crisis. There's no money around to do what you yeah. need to do. And it's the worst time ever 
to be in that crisis because it's in the worst state it's ever been. And we keep getting these state of environment reports and they say everything's, you know, buggered pretty much, to be honest, and it's mm. getting worse. And we, it just, I think, you know, any of these budgets, federal or state, represent people's values and, you know, it speaks pretty clearly. Mm. The environment is way down the bottom and we can't do what needs to be done. And, mm. and I actually think that's a, a big part of why, you know, the governments have shifted recently to priority lists of species like if you just have a priority list of 20 species then you can have a tiny amount of money and possibly make a difference but that that ignores the way ecosystems work and by taking that approach we might create more problems than we think we're fixing you know you save 20 icon species but the building blocks of an ecosystem disappear and then you go Oh, why? Why can't we get any bang for our buck for these twenty icon species, priority species? It's we just we just don't know enough to know. <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. that's the crazy the crazy thing. Yeah, uh, I think it could I think it could work if all of the species were on the priority list. Then <laughs> then it could all work. Like if you just did a thousand single species studies, I'm sure it would add up to ecosystem you know recovery. But, yeah, instead you get the good news story of one species. Meanwhile, the rest of the place is going down the toilet. You've spent six years on the project, so that means you've spent a lot of time in the Mallee and it's a place that not a lot of people go to. It's not a high priority for tourists yet. But do you think there's towns in that region, and that's a big a big area, but do you think there's towns there that ecotourism, wildlife tourism can give a bit of a lifeline to and, and that the priority could move from agriculture because it's marginal to to another source of income? And and I'm leading towards can we actually make the Mallee Emu Wren valuable and the Red Lord Whistler and what what other birds were you were you working well, on? Well, the mallee fowl is a big name. Like, the mallee fowl. The, the grass wren is a beautiful bird. So, there, yeah, there are there are some there are some species that are delights for birders, and then there are some species that have broader reach to non-birders. And the mallee fowl is definitely in the latter category. Everyone loves that, and which is great. So it's a great icon species, and you know it's, it's loved by farmers as well as conservationists. So that's a nice crossover there as well. So do you think there is an opportunity in the region? Because you're familiar with it. I, I I know it very, I mean, I know Hadda, the Hadda Lakes, the northern area of the, the region we're talking about. But do you think there's potential to try and get more money into the economy, the, the conservation economy and management economy of the Mallee? So, yeah, so... The, the tourism that's currently there is for the beauty of the landscape, I guess, and for the nature. Like, yeah, if you're in these national parks, yeah, I'd, every second person is a birder that's going there. So I'd say there is an industry around nature tourism and there's also commercial bird tours that are already there. So those those aspects are there, but it's it doesn't mean you're going to, every farmer's going to be a tour guide <laughs> no. in the near future but uh, I think yeah so so yeah ecotourism is there and it is important mm. Mm. and you know maybe it's taken for granted that you actually have to have the nature there to have that ecotourism because there are some spots where you know it's probably the bird decline has helped ecotourism because now this is like there's one spot in Murray Sunset National Park it's the only place to go to see a Red Lord Whistler so then <laughs> you know suddenly there's a a flood of, of birdos wanting to see the Red World Whistler and they come to this region. And so that's a multi-day four-wheel driving trip and you go on, you know, so you have to go local stays and on the way there and local shopping and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure where it's quantified if Parks Victoria do this sort of quantifying contributions to local economies, but I think the industry is there. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Uh, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to find is that, Governments tend to value so many things in our normal economy and they 
they give a value to something. I'm hoping that we can eventually shift the conversation so that the each Mally Ren, uh, Mally Emu Ren, actually has a value to the country that they they attach a value to it. You know, if there if there's a hundred thousand people visiting the region because they want to see the Red Lord Whistler and the Mally Emu Ren and the striated grass Ren, and if those hundred thousand people are worth a million dollars in terms of their stay and their food and their petrol and the whole the whole lot. Well, let's try and get fifty grand of that into conservation. You know that that's how I'd like to to see it, so that there so that there are that we we can change the taxation system and the excise system and the all, all those things. I mean, I'm talking fantasy in the I, short term, but. I, I, I hate this. I hate this idea. Yeah. <laughs> Putting a, I don't think there's anything worse you could do, put a dollar sign on every in your rent and say oh. it's worth this much. Like, I just think no, well, that's no. not, I mean, the funding model we shouldn't be looking for is the species that are benefiting the economy. Like, I just yeah, don't no, 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 like, no, you know. no, I, t- I totally agree with you when you look at it in isolation. What, what, I would like to see is that whenever they talk about money for the regions and everything, they always talk about we've got to improve the infrastructure and we've got to improve the built environment or whatever. So they can always find money for that. They can never find money for maintaining. And and I'm not even talking about growing. It's just maintaining what we've already got. So, yeah, I, I, I totally take your point and I agree. I don't want to assign a value to an emu rent for someone to exploit. That's yep. not... That's not how I'm seeing it. So that then you create, you know, markets for, you know, disreputable stuff going on. But oh, it's but more sure, like but, to say why would I fund why would I fund the grass room because it's not adding to the economy anyway. So, um, for example, well, it's a, yeah, this, yeah. This isn't, I, but, doesn't have, but I will I, I will I will respond to what you were saying anyway because yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting experiment thought experiment, and I think of two examples in North America. Using eBird records, there was someone that traced how many people, when there was a mega rarity, came to the northern US. I don't remember, it got blown over from Europe, and he used eBird and surveys to work out how many people came to this little town to see this one bird, where they came. He did surveys on the ground, where did they come from, and worked out the millions of dollars that it contributed to tourism economy from that one single bird. And that sounds like the sort of thing you're talking about. But the more interesting well, example, I think, is um, except the, except before you before you move on, I would say except that what we don't want is more birds that are rare that prompt the stampede of birders. You know, a vagrant species turns up somewhere, and everyone goes because there's only one of them. We don't want only one of them. What we want is the Mally emu wren to be uh, quite common, and that people go to experience the Mallee environment as a totality, not not to check off one bird that might disappear next year. That's okay. so so I, yeah. I so I want to place the discussion there. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, I think so yeah, I think what you're describing is in a way, yeah, what exists already because people go for the Mallee experience and that includes the landscapes and the isolation and not seeing anyone for days and in this woodland that extends as far as the eye can see and the beautiful sunsets and the clear skies at night and the birds that are there so yeah. it forms part of the sense of the place and then forms what is special about the place so it, it fits in that can i tell you the the other the other yeah 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 yeah, yeah sorry I, I i just wanted to 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 make sure i wasn't promoting that idea that you you, you build a tourism economy based on the rarity of something that wasn't where i was going so the other example is little penguins and you know there's a huge ecotourism economy around the penguin parade on phillip island outside of melbourne i think i think the penguin parade i could be wrong with this but for international visitors it goes the opera house uluru the penguin parade they're the three yeah. most commonly visited locations yep. and so there's yeah and it's not just there it's it's in all along Eastern Australia and in other countries as well, like New Zealand. There's a tourism industry around penguins. And there was a recent study documenting the amount of money that goes into the ecotourism industry of penguins and how much of that money goes to penguin conservation, as in the source of all the wealth is the penguins. 
and it's negligible. It's none of it, pretty much. So no, um, and that that and that's and the problem that, of pointing yeah. towards. You know. And 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 I'm starting to see that with koalas because we are now not making a fair income to use our lovely Australian term. We're not making a fair income effort. Yep, we're not making a fair income dinky die ridgy ditch effort. True blue effort to preserve the koala as a viable species in the wild in New South Wales and perhaps Queensland. A whole lot of recent decisions mean that it's unlikely that you're going to see them in New South Wales in the wild in 100 years. I hope I'm wrong. But there will be a very, very, very important tourism industry for people to stop off at all the zoos and reserves and get their photo taken there because there's a healthy population in captivity and they're worth a lot of money to have that's photos right. taken with and eaten. That that's not that is no basis for for preserving wild wild species. That's just mm-hmm. not where my head's at. I, I I'm trying to find some way that that I'm sure people are apply I'm sure economists and whatnot are applying their brains to this too. But how do you make it valuable for everyone in the community to preserve a bird that nobody might ever see? <laughs> that's that's the really difficult thing because we give money away to do a whole lot of stuff that doesn't work, you know. There's always a new tax break for stuff that doesn't work. I mean, how much money have we done on uh, carbon sequestration? And, you know, we did this how, from million for the latest round, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, how, how far could that go for you, Simon, you know? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> shattering to think about the things you could do. Just the, um, yeah, so working with this Threatened Mallee Birds Conservation Action Plan team and we've just been prioritising the actions we want to take over the next few years and once we got our big wish list up, then we look at which ones are fundable and which ones we should go for. And, yeah, the difference between what we want to do and what we can do is, is stark. And yeah, But I'm sure we could fill the whole list with the with the 50 million that goes to carbon capture and storage. Yeah. Well, I've, I've done my usual ramble on and, and get totally off track, so... Simon, what do you think the next move is for the Mallee Emu rent? What would you like to see happen next? It's a tricky one. So there's this the main thing I want to do now is there's a we talk about we're thinking about Mallee Emu rents and their conservation in terms of how many reserves still have them. Like that's our metric of success, and that's why we did the translocation. We wanted to get another number there. And so there's this. There's a, there's, a, there's a hidden factor in all of these calculations and that is across the southern part of their range, there's this really big reserve network that we know almost nothing about. So we know there's a handful of emurens still in there, but we don't know how many, where exactly, except for one or two spots, what they need, how we're going to keep them. And so in my mind, that population works as like, I think of it in terms of a translocation that's already been successful except we never needed to do it. So suddenly we've got a small number of birds in this population, like the hard work's been done for us and we haven't taken the time to, you know, make the most of that infrastructure, if you want, or the hard work that's been done before. So I think we've really got to capitalise on that asset and get in there, figure out lots about it and make them thrive. And I think that's going to be more successful probably than a translocation with all the barriers and challenges in there. Mm. So that's where I want to focus my energies and that's what I reckon is the next step. So, yeah, if we can figure out where they are, we could put some fire breaks around them so that any fire that happens is not going to burn all of them and we have another disaster. We can work out what sort of fire is good for them and then we can manage fire carefully to promote them. We can think about, you know, ways of connecting the reserves, like you mentioned, the 100-year plan of revegetation that's that's a lot of research as well as a lot of on-ground work still needs to happen there but yeah i guess that's where i'd like to focus sounds look uh, i really enjoyed talking to you simon because you're far more considered <laughs> about everything you're, admittedly you've had six years to, to, to think about it but i think 
if we could have some of the decision makers applying your methodology and your temperament, I think we would have some some pretty, pretty good results. Now, Simon, I think we'll wrap up the Mally Emu ran there and we'll move into our bird emergency questions that everybody is the victim of. Simon, when you're out doing field work or birding for pleasure, mm-hmm. what's your field guide of choice? Well, you know, obviously it, I, I grew up with Pizzy, I guess, and then the app came out for Morecambe first, so I switched to Morecambe and I've stayed there ever since, so, yeah. So you're mostly using the app? You're not I'm, I'm you're not fully on the app. I don't carry okay. my book around. Yeah. You don't I carry do your have I have the ABG, a recent gift, uh, Christmas gift, um, and I love it. And I just look at it at home. I don't, <laughs> I don't bring it out with me necessarily. But I just, yeah, like it. I just like having it and reading about it and that sort of thing. More of a reference and, book, I guess. And for the non-completely bird nerd audience and the internationals, that's the Australian Bird Guide, the ABG. It's like the, the next generation yeah. bird guide. That what is it? The, the first new release in quite a while, maybe 10 years or something. Mm, mm, um, that's right. That's yeah. right. It, it, look, mm-hmm. uh, and and it's a stunning it's a stunning book. Mm, it really is a good book. They're all good, though. No no, no, <laughs> no judgment. I'm just proud of all of them. It's an incredible yeah. undertaking. It must have taken yeah. years and years to do that sort of work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's right. Look, it's always a labour of love in this, in this game. Yeah. Um, mm. You mean you're not making big bucks off this podcast? Simon, if I could tell you how much money this podcast cost me, I would. I'd, I need that footballer's, uh, a proportion of that footballer's salary to stay above water too. But, but look, it's like everything in this part of society and our community is that we're nearly all doing it for basically nothing. I mean, mm. a, even people who are drawing a salary from a university or from some NGO or whatnot, it's not it's not the salary you get if you are digging up rocks or sli- or securing slimy black liquid out of the out of the earth. I mean, it's just not even in the same universe. So <laughs> that's my that's my opinion piece. Simon, what's your favourite piece of? I'm so sad to be answering this. I'm so sad to be giving the answer I'm about to give. But my phone, for sure. Yes, it's, it's like a, it's like the modern day multi tool. It's got a flashlight. It's got a camera. It's got a bird app, including the calls for playback. You can actually call people on it in case you're in trouble. But I use this. I use an app that has georeferenced PDF maps. So I put all my sites on there. And I have points on there and I can see satellite imagery of what I'm looking at. And every bird, I get all my volunteers to download the same app and the same maps. And every bird they get, they record it on this. And that's how they export all their data to me. So I'm not doing months of data entry at the end. And it's just, and it's a better GPS than the GPSs. So, but I, you know, I hate carrying my phone around. I think it's bullshit. But at least when you're out in the Mallee, there's no reception. So it really is just a multi-tool. It's not a phone at all. So that's the one saving grace. How many battery packs do you have to take with you? Everyone has to take a battery pack, yeah, and charge it each night. Got like a big solar setup, you know, with a deep cycle battery and a solar panel and all these USB ports and all that sort of thing. Wires hanging out of every which hole. Yeah, but there's been multiple, multiple issues because, yeah, that drains the battery. And if you don't have your battery pack, then you're just standing in the middle of nowhere on your own, <laughs> which has That's happened right. a few times. That's we, right. and we also make everyone pack a compass, so if it comes to that, you just have to walk north to them or whatever. Oh, that that raises the question: Does anybody have a paper hard copy map in their in their pack? No, 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 no. we haven't been doing that. No, a thing of the past, a relic, a relic for old fellas like myself. I, I made these big ones, like I printed out big A0 ones and carried them at camp and then we could tick off our, you know, our efforts at the end of every day and write down what we found just for fun, I guess, and for getting a big picture. But, that, yeah, I know people, but, sometimes people go, where's the hard copy? I say, I don't know, I don't have it. You go you print it out if you want it. 
So the, the the big map was really your field work whiteboard, wasn't it? Just it was because yeah. we had whiteboards as well, but they were taken yeah. up with logistics and car shuffles of who's getting dropped off where and when they're going to picked up and at what time should they call press the red button on the emergency device. I must say I'm really interested, but we can't do it today, but I'd really like to talk to you another time about that whole logistical effort um, of working in a remote situation with with so many people. Talk to a lot of people who do remote work, but when you've got an army of people out there with oh, loads of vehicles, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll take that up with you another time, but I reckon that would be, it certainly would fascinate me. Um, what's your favourite bird, Simon? Someone asked me this the other day while we were talking about it. So you, you, with these bird emergency questions, do you have to answer or? Well, 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 I don't have a hit squad coming to, to do anything bad to you, but it's just interesting. A lot of people will say, Obviously, the Mally Emu ran because I've been working so much on it. But I'd like to know what, when you're not working, you know, what what are you dreaming about? Are you dreaming about the palm cockatoo is very popular as a as a favourite yeah. bird. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a funny thing. Like I would answer a different thing yesterday to today. Like I was thinking, you know, the wedge-tailed eagle just because it, it awes you. But then I love babblers because they're so funny with their behaviour. And now, like a few common birds, because you have that interaction and connection with them, like magpies or blue wrens or something like that. So yeah, it's a really, it's a really tricky one to say. But today, just for fun, <laughs> I would use the beach stone curly because they're so funky looking. Yeah. Now, it, it, are we calling that a beach stone curly or the southern stone curly or what? What's oh, its really. What's its real name now? It'll oh, be different. Really like It'll be different next name. month or. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm out of date, obviously. Yeah. Or, I just I, or, I thought I was up to date because I don't call it a bush uh, a beach thick knee anymore. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I I saw one once from a distance, but I've I've never been close to one up near Gladstone. I got to see one. What's your bucket list bird? Easy. That one is easy. Night parrot. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I heard one in the Mallee, got super excited, but it was a it was a female pallid cuckoo and it does this oh. hollow whistle sound at mm. you know two hours before sunrise. And I was like, well, what else would call two hours before sunrise and do the same call as a night parrot in the middle of Spinifex Field? Um, <laughs> Just out of so interest, was, who set you straight on that one? It was Nick. I don't remember Nick's last name. He studies Nick, the night parrot. Nick, Nick Leeson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, he, he, he he burst burst your, that was probably a pallid cuckoo. Yeah. yeah, burst your bubble. Sorry about that, Simon. Uh, I managed uh, to tell a few people before he burst it anyway. <laughs> Stringing him along. Very good. Very good. Uh, what's your favourite place to go birding? I guess one of my best birding experiences would have to be the Dawn Chorus at Fog Dam, just out of Darwin. Have you been there? Uh, I ha- I haven't. I've got that on my list for depending on how our lockdowns and all that st- stuff yeah. keep happening. But no, yeah. I'm hoping late 21, 22 to get uh, yeah. so to get I there. Think That's, it was, um, yeah, I think it was, of, it was it's a big wetland, tropical wetland near Darwin. I think it was a failed infrastructure project to build a rice yeah. field. But when they started building it, the magpie geese came and ate it all, and now yeah. it's just a huge natural wetland and. It was just, um, you couldn't keep up. Every bird that you saw was like the most stunning thing. They're very spectacular birds, but there's such diversity and abundance there that you have to look away from one to the next magical thing, and it's a bit overwhelming, really. Quite stunning. Yeah. Now, is, is Fog Dam synonymous with Humpty Doo? Yeah, it is near Humpty yeah, Doo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, Which is I a mean, very outback I'll, club just south of Darwin. Well, that's right. Well, I'll, I'll, Old fellas like me, when we were getting our Australia's wildlife, uh, wildlife heritage, and all that kind of stuff as kids, and dreaming about where we, where we wanted to, to go, no one knew about Fog Dam. It was just Humpty Doo. We were going to Humpty Doo wetlands. So, where's your bucket list location, Simon? Australian or global? Global. It's it's your it's your bucket list, buddy. I wouldn't mind going to. I'm still going to choose Australian. <laughs> Silly question. Then I think I'd like to go to the Kimberleys, please. Oh, well, you're allowed. Yeah. 
cheap flights now, apparently, Simon. So. Yeah, um, I think it would be great to go along Gid River Road and, you know, just see what it has to offer. I mean, it's sort of arid country and there's spin effects, but then there's also gorges and ravines and it's just it's just a beautiful and strange landscape. I just love to get up there. Tropical as well. So it's got it all. I just went, I went recently up the West Coast and I got to Exmouth and I swam with the whale sharks and I thought that was great. But you can swim with uh, humpback whales now as well, which I wouldn't mind doing. I reckon that'd be pretty, pretty cool thing to do. So I wouldn't mind going back there when I go to the Kimberleys. Didn't get yourself out to the Abrolis, did you? No, no, nothing like that. Nothing like that. <laughs> nothing um, like that. Sunday, Christmas Island would be cool. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Simon, this is a question for me because I've just been thinking about the Mallee. It's just come to mind. Can you? Would it be possible without without a four wheel drive? Could you get out there on a trail bike or something and set yourself up with a swag and get around? Or do you need do you need a four wheel drive? No, tra- trail bikes definitely can can go anywhere. They can go anywhere, and they've got. There's yeah. actually a lot of dirt bike tracks, illegal dirt bike tracks, all through some of the reserves that are used to great extent and with great gusto, not by me, but by people from Mildura and people from Melbourne. And so you, you often share share a campfire with those people in the night, which is they hear about the weird bird doing their, <laughs> their crazy things. And there are a couple of two-wheel drive areas too. So, yeah, you shouldn't let the access be a barrier to you seeing the area. So at a cool kind National Park, that's two-wheel drive. And- I love I love Hatter and like Lake, Mo- Lake Mournpool is one of my favourite places on yeah, earth um, it's a very special place because you have a huge a huge lake natural wetland ephemeral lake that has the sunrise coming over all the red gums and mm-hmm. an abundance of water birds and then you walk 200 meters and you're in red sands spin effects mallees okay. and other completely different you know you think you're in the arid yeah. zones so it's a very and interesting spot is, isn't that amazing when you walk over the lip and mm-hmm. you know, that that is just yeah that's just a classic Amazing place. I, I I've implored many times people who are visitors to that area to, um, especially if you're going to to had a had a cool kind, just do walk walk off the tracks a little bit. Of, of course, tread carefully, be very careful. But it's it's amazing. The tra- the tracks are so well worn. People, the fringe of maybe 20, 30 meters off each track. And then all of a sudden, it just changes. If you walk a hundred meters, you'll see things you'll never, you'll never forget. Yeah. The Mallee is a place to, the, the more you open up and slow down and pay attention, the more it offers you. So you, you could walk through thinking there's nothing there, or you could just, you know, start appreciating what is in your immediate surrounds, and you'll find more and more complexity and get more and more drawn in. So, I think it, it's a wonderful place for that. Well, that's a pretty good place to end i think simon we've we've waxed lyrical uh, a little bit different to to the normal normal approach what's next for you simon well hopefully this that meant what i mentioned about looking for all these threatened melee birds in these southern systems that we know nothing about so i guess the most so yeah they were waiting on a, on a grant application at the moment to see if that gets up and then that would be a couple of years of me just walking around big desert and Narcat and some other reserves down there. And I guess the most headline exciting thing that could come of that is this the Western Whitbird, which is, you know, not been seen in in Victoria since the 70s, I think, but it could still be out in this area. So it could be the rediscovery of the Western Whitbird, but or it might be confirming it that it's not going to get rediscovered. But either way, we'll be able to say something about it. But yeah, it's going to be focusing, if if it gets up, we'll be focusing on maybe 10 different species, and that includes the Malian Uran and the Red Lord Whistler and the Grass Wren and yeah, and the Whitbird and, and many others. So that's that's how I want to spend my next couple of years. So we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> well, put me on the on the mailing list. I, I might try out an e bike to get out there and and do some low low impact, low carbon burning and and maybe do some volunteer sessions for you and bring my. Bring my electronic device and fill up, fill in on your on your app. Very cool. And I should add also that that I think that area some people flag as the Victorian chance for the for the night parrot as well. So just to throw some 
crazy yeah. birds in the mix. You can come and find a night parrot for me. Have you good? I love the icon species. I love to talk about them. And, and of course, I was a kid who drew night parrots in my sketchbook when I was six or seven, you know, and the helmeted honey eater was the big the big one then when everyone was trying to preserve them, and that's been a, a success story. But, yeah, look, it's just great. Being a birder is great. Oh, I'd left off the most important question where we get to place you on the, on the spectrum. Now, you don't have a notebook when you're out in the field, so you're not, you're not ticking off your lifers. But are you a are you a birder who keeps a list? If I said, "What's your life? What's your life number, Simon?" What are you going to tell me? I usually say around, probably around over four hundred, I think, but around four hundred. But I haven't so you, counted for I haven't counted for probably five or ten years. I'd have to go through the book. Yeah. So you're you're somewhere in the middle on the spectrum, I think, because I I couldn't tell you whether I. I think I was probably 11 or 12 or something when I got to about 300 and I don't think I've ever thought about it since. So, um, yeah, well, that's good. We've we've worked out you're not – but you're, you, I can tell by your writing that it's more important for you to be out there and involved in the, in the environment than ticking off a species. Yeah, that's right. I'm interested in, yeah – understanding the system or getting connected with the system at least having my own understanding of it and then yeah just thinking up questions and being there you know I guess one of the the sadder parts I love doing all this community like communal work with volunteers and connecting with people but I never really get many chances just to go out on my own and I could be out on my own for a week and just you know get the sand between my toes. So I feel like that's sometimes a missed opportunity that doesn't, you know, it'd be good if there was a balance between the two. But, yeah, I just want to want to be there and connect with the place, I guess. That's, that's my goal. That's my jam. That's your jam. Well, I'm glad we've discovered your jam. Simon Verdon, hey, uh, the world's expert, current expert on Malayemi Wrens. <laughs> I, think, I, think I think you can probably wear that crown. Let's just go with Professor Simon, I think, for now. That's right, Professor Simon. Well, it seems to be everyone's an associate professor nowadays. <laughs> yeah, when, when you get to professor, you stop doing interviews. That's right. That's, that's right. You, you stop going out of your office. You just go to meetings about funding, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Simon, thanks so much for being on the Bird Emergency. Thank you, dear listener, for staying with us. I look forward to bringing you the next instalment. I'm Grant Williams. See you next time.